people from the different um, nations, countries around the world in which you live and work. Um, our next presentation is by Rob Magnuson Smith. So, Rob. Hello. Well, if I've learned uh, one thing from this conference, it's that the continent of Antarctica uh, means uh, many things, um, not just one thing. Um, and even at its most basic level, I've been really engaged to with the, uh, surprisingly for me as a humanitarian, or humanities uh, researcher and, and practitioner, but I've been interested in, in things like measurement. Um, and it's been somewhat um, enlightening and inspiring, actually, that these different paradigms of measurement um, can, can vary. Um, but uh, sadly, the public understanding um, has a little nuance. Um, and my contention is that this is because of often fictional treatments of, of the poles, the polar regions. I'm a novelist and a uh, short story writer and an investigative journalist. And I uh, head up the director of uh, directorship for global engagement at Exeter University. And um, I also teach on our, our environmental humanities course, which has just started this year. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit today about some representations of the polar regions in fiction. Um, the examples might seem rather dated, um, but as you all know, early perceptions um, are difficult to shake, um, and they take hold over generations. And um, I, I think I'd just add that underneath these rather titillating tales of alien races um, is a real existential hope. Um, and I think this is what lies underneath most exploration, most understanding, most scientific inquiry, is a hope um, that we learn something about ourselves, um, but that it's coupled often with dread. Because the hope, um, as we know, often comes to very little. So we have this oddly um, childish notion, uh, saying we, the public, um, about what science can deliver. And like Santa Claus, we learn later on that it doesn't come with the same kinds of nice packaging that we would like. Um, so I'll start with a quote here by Clifford Sunak, who um, contends that science fiction has fallen down has uh, failed as a genre um, because of its um, quasi-state. This is why um, people like Margaret Atwood don't like the phrase. Um, she likes the phrase speculative fiction, even though for all intents and purposes she's writing science fiction. Um, and it's uh, rather sad, I think, in some ways, um, that Sunak um, has this particular view because underlying this uh, quote, implied in the quote, is a choice um, that the public faces. Uh, I'm talking about the reading public here. People who read for information and for engagement and for entertainment, and also to communicate with their friends and family uh, about what it is they're inspired by. And underneath this quote is the implication that the public has a choice between science communication, which is often abstruse and often difficult to understand, or uh, science fiction, which is titillating, easy to understand, but often based on nothing other than speculation. So I think the third way um, that I might offer um, both in terms of what I like to read and what I hopefully try to write, is a way that addresses the individual um, who is more often than not faced with this existential uncertainty as to what we're doing here in the first place. And um, science fiction that leans toward truth, uh, however you want to interpret that, uh, does a better job. So the chief question, I guess, here to put it another way, is how do we take, how does the public take polar regions seriously? How can they? When popular fiction twists 
our stories into sensational tales. Should the public be blamed uh, for having this false binary? Probably not. Um, and what are, the, what are the upshots for writers and for scientists and people who communicate science in that way? Let's go back a little to um, how we got here. Um, our first, the, the world's first in, 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 in many ways, our first understanding of the word pole um, in English um, comes from this idea that we're talking about a tree-like object standing there that represents a target. And built into that is the notion of forbidden fruit. Um, the poles um, have been depicted in this way uh, for many years. And they don't only have um, English-speaking traditions at their basis. Um, there are um, lots of uh, mystical traditions that depict uh, the North and the South Poles as, as Gardens of Eden. Um, the Greek myth, Hyperborea, is a, is a story that talks about a, a civil, genteel race. Um, and they live in this frozen north, above the frozen north, uh, in this uh, incredibly uh, wonderful, heavenly place uh, where everyone gets along, and yet it's really difficult to get there. Um, we go into Norse myth and Egdrasil. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you who know the, 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 um, the sagas uh, with, to do with Odin, uh, these are copied down in the 13th century, but predate that by hundreds of years. And the idea is this Egdrisel is this tree that undergirds all of life. And in the Eddas, in the Norse Eddas, this tree um, is the basis for all existence. It's the basis for the universe. However, uh, Odin uh, was found hung on this tree. So again, we have this odd coupling of a place that invites us, and yet we should be careful if we get there. Um, now, these uh, larger historical myths undergird also more recent, in the last 200 years, approaches to storytelling to do with the poles. And um, these Stories often have to do with stories of doctors who were drugged with opiates, who during this hypnosis talk about what they have seen in other um, times. And these particular um, stories uh, were, were told by people uh, like Ed Edgar Allan Poe and Bram Stoker, um, Daphne de Maurier, Charles Dickens, um, and others. And they were popularized also by Madame Blavatsky. I'm not sure if anyone knows who Madame Blavatsky is or was, um, but she was a Ukrainian mystic who had a um, huge amount of influence in popular culture, both in terms of her writing and her friends. She, was, um, she inspired people like Aleister Crowley, the occultist, who um, himself was a keen mountaineer. Um, and she inspired people like Rudolf Steiner, who, those of you who know Anthroposophy and the Waldorf schools, et cetera, take a direct connection to Madame Blavatsky and, um, and to her seeing, her seeing about these places, these mystical poles. And she believed, and she wrote very eloquently about the poles being imbued by magnetic force, intelligent life, and that there was these magnetic polar beings that channeled us to find them. And that itself had um, a lot of impact on what came around that time, which was polar exploration. So of course in the 19th century we have these major expeditions like Franklin in 45 and Nansen in 1856. Um, Peary, 1909, we're talking about late 19th century 
surge of interest in polar expeditions. It's, it's useful to keep in mind when we think about MH370 and how many times we tried to send out ships to find this missing plane in, <clears throat> in the Indian Ocean, think about the difficulty in the 19th century when 39 separate expeditions were launched to try to find the Franklin Expedition. With a price tag of $2 million in today's money for anyone who came back, not just with Franklin, but valid information. And this drove, as you can imagine, a sea of people um, to both replicate Franklin's journey and to come back with something tangible. And um, what happened was their exploits were reported in newspapers and magazines in Britain and America with weekly installments. And what ran alongside those weekly installments of expeditions? Tales, stories, uh, by uh, short story writers and novelists who wrote sometimes convincingly in scientific-like prose about alien races and cannibalism and um, the uh, notion of underneath the poles, alien civilizations, keeping um, pets, etc. And they were, they were highly popular, and they sold newspapers um, for uh, many decades on this particular um, time. One of these books was called The Purple Cloud. Now these days, very few people know about this book, but it was a bestseller almost immediately after publication. The Purple Cloud came out in 1901, and roughly speaking, it put M.P. Scheele on the map. It's still in print, by the way. If anyone wants to go find it, you can go get yourself a penguin and copy uh, with a nice preface by someone a lot more intelligent than I am who can tell you all about its uh, literary importance. But to this particular topic, I'll just say that we should think about these plot points. Perhaps you should think about these plot points carefully. It's about money. It's about fame. The protagonist in M.P. Shields' novel is not meant to be on the expedition, but his wife, who is herself a daughter of a famous uh, expedition scientist, whose cousin is meant to go on an expedition, urges him to get himself on the ship, and he does so by murder. And he murders over and over again to get on the ship so that he can then return with the cash. What happens? He gets over the border, he gets to the North Pole, and instantly he turns around and there's a purple cloud coming across the world. And that purple cloud, he later finds out, is made of hydrocyanic acid, and it wipes out the entire Earth population. He's left alone. His name is Adam, so it's got these ideas of the first person. But instead of believing that he's so happy to be uh, the first there, he becomes invested with his own power and he feels that it's important to destroy every single standing city. And for the rest of the novel, and you think this is going to be weird because it goes on from the 200 pages where he goes from city to city to city destroying every temple, church, um, and habitation on the planet single-handedly. Of course, it stretches into the fantasy. But the idea is that be careful what you ask for. If you get to a place like the Poles, um, this is what you're going to get. H.P. Lovecraft, for those of you who are big fans of Lovecraft, I won't need to explain this too much, but this novel was the first to use quasi-scientific language um, as it relates to Antarctica. And he prefaces it with this ironic um, sort of Yes, I know, I know, I know this. You should probably only be careful if you're going to read any further. I'm only going to tell you. Uh, I'm just warning you. Keep reading, but I'm kind of reluctant. This is his tone throughout the novel. And it works. Because, of course, people say, oh, and I want to read that then. And what they get is uh, ghoulish discoveries. Uh, frightening, frightening discoveries. And they're framed by the minutiae. They're only made possible because of 
Lovecraft's diligence to science at the time. So what he does is he sneaks in, this, the titillating, inside of, framed by, thick, thick text of uh, latitudes. Ice, sheet, shelf, thickness, width, measurements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And inside of that, you don't know you're reading it, but soon enough you get to these alien races. And um, I love the language, um, as you can see at that quote, stark nightmare spires, gulfs of remote time and space. I could not help feeling that they were evil things. Notice how he anthropomorphizes these places, mountains of madness, whose further slopes looked out over some accursed ultimate abyss. And that's important because what he's doing there is he's creating a sense of impending doom that's both physical, external, and internal. They're matched together. They're married to each other. Now, for those of you who are fans of The Thing, which is obviously our most popular um, treatment of the Antarctic, we forget that it was published in 1938 as a novella. This novel, novella um, has this incredible power of pulling you into this concept that we uh, find in, in Antarctica a uh, trace of alien civilizations that are just waiting for us to come along and they can morph and they want to use us to get to the next uh, solar system. And the film treatment, I, I, I just pulled this clip off, uh, uh, picture off the internet, and it looks a lot like my former president, so I apologize for that. Um, but but it, it does, uh, I think, uh, terrify, right? Keep in mind, again, the way in which the novella is framed. It's ironic. You're lulled into a sense. You wouldn't be so far amiss if you walked through the poster boards out there. After a while, you kind of get lulled into this sort of quasi sense of, oh, I'm in, I'm in good company here. These people know what they're talking about. Oh, just, this, is all, this is all very on the up and up. And then inside, can you imagine if you put inside of your poster board, uh, oh, by the way, we also found an alien race. This is what was being read. And it was really compelling. And it changed the way that people thought about the poles. And look at all these ways that he cadges and he, and he, and he um, ironizes uh, his own work. Next we have Ballard's The Drown Drowned World. Now this starts to become a little bit more sophisticated in its science, it's a little bit more comfortable and familiar with what we can imagine is plausible. It's set in the future, so it's not a, a, a travel log. It's not saying what has happened. It's set in the future, so it's a futuristic science fiction tale. And this particular tale moves us into a sense of doom that is plausible. And what we have is we have this arco-psychic past, right, tapped by dreams. And the way forward is to go south to the amniotic fluid. It becomes an eco-feminist reading. And that's when it's, things get much more interesting. Because to go back in time, the first eco-feminist reading of the polls was Shelley. Perhaps the most compelling and for me, and for my money, the best written book about the polar regions still is Frankenstein. And it has to do with our concept of what we're doing here to begin with. Keep in mind that the epigraph for Frankenstein was from Milton's Paradise Lost. Did I request thee, maker? Did I request thee, maker, from my clay to mold me man? And the implication there is no. No, 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 no. Nobody requested anyone to do this. We're here, we don't know why, and what are we supposed to do about it? Well, be very careful if you want to create something because that person, that thing, might come back and get you. And where do they get you? The poles. The North Pole. Why? Because Shelley went to the Vale of Chamonix with Percy when she was uh, just 17 years old, and you can see the inspiration there of these places. And look at the language, again, this anthropomorphizing of mountains, snakes, 
that watch their prey. Really, we're going to start thinking about mountains and glaciers as snakes that watch their prey? Well, yes. Percy did very well with poems like this. And Mary did very well with novels like hers. And why? It has nothing to do with anything other than our dread, our sense of confusion as to what we're doing here. And it's set so imbued in the fiction that it works. And why is this refrain of madness? Well, because it's true that we've, ha we've heard uh, in our own lifetime people who have come back from Antarctica changed. And they're not changed for the better. Often people say they're changed from creeping madness. And so those tend to have this circular sense of reinforcement and we have this odd psychological loop. These are real-time narratives from people being airlifted out of McMurdo, etc., that seep into um, our stories. And I like uh, Kathleen Schultz's quote here in The New Yorker just a few years ago about what this means about humanity. And I'll close with our la my last slide, which has to do with our questions. This, to me, is relatively provocative. Schultz says, it's worth remembering when we choose Shackleton over Shelley that in the long history of Arctic literature, the putative nonfiction has seldom offered the most truthful or most useful account of the Poles. Now, if that's right, she might have a bit of hate of, to, over on the poster session. Because I would imagine that Catherine Schultz would ask us to do the second question there, and that's to start thinking about how to make our storytelling perhaps a bit more charged with traditional elements like characters, plot, a meaningful sense of thematic unity as opposed to just throwing up data, a meaningful approach to the reader, the public, if we want to move past this horrible divide that faces us today. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks. Uh